Okay. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's event. Thank you all for joining us um, for this virtual platica. I'm Natalie Rodriguez, and um, I am a staff member at the Esperanza. And I would like to, um, we're gonna get started. I'm gonna pass it off to one of our board members um, to introduce the editor and, and, and the panelists. But I just want to, um, I already thanked you all, but uh, if you would like to um, check out some of our other upcoming programming, you can always visit our website, our Facebook page, and this program, um, along with all our other programming, is supported and sponsored by our generous donors and our Buena Gente. So um, if you would like to make a donation today, you can always visit um, our website at esperanzacenter.org slash donate. Um, you can also uh, uh, make a, a gift on Venmo. And if you have any questions, please um, always reach out to us on our social medias. Um, our email is esperanzacenter. Um, Esperanza at esperanzacenter.org. If you ever have any inquiries or you just um, have something to tell us. But without further ado, I will pass it on to one of our conjunto members, our board members, Norma Elia Cantu. Muchas gracias, Natalie. Thank you so much. And welcome everyone to this uh, incredible session that we're having this morning, Una Plática, this afternoon, actually, where I'm at. I would like to begin by acknowledging the spirits of the Esperanza Peace and Justice Center, our ancestors, and all who have made it possible for us to be here. Muchas gracias to the universe. I would like to now begin by just saying that as a member of the Conjunto de Nepantleras, our board, if you will, I welcome all of you and invite you to participate in the many, many cultural events, um, and community service events that the Esperanza hosts. And so please visit our website for more information. As Natalie says, <laughs> donations are always welcome. Join us by becoming an ongoing supporter and becoming a monthly donor. That really helps us to plan and have uh, security. So muchas gracias. So, uh, today's Latinas and the Politics of Urban Spaces Virtual Platica includes the two co-editors, Liliana Patricia Saldana, and unfortunately, Sharon Navarro is not going to be able to join us this morning. Uh, she had something come up, so I'm still going to introduce her because Sharon, a colleague at UTSA when I taught there, is a professor of political science there. She was born and raised in El Paso. So she's a fronteriza. And after receiving her bachelor's and master's at UT El Paso, went on to receive master's and doctorate from the University of Wisconsin in Madison. As an expert and consultant on Latinas in American politics, she has authored several books and articles on the subject. Her most recent publications include a book, Race, Gender, Sexuality, and the Politics of the American Judiciary, and Latinas in American Politics and Latino Urban Agency. She is also a co-author of Politicos, Latina Public Officials in Texas. I think that's the one that's in my series at a and Press. And then also a Latina legislator, Leticia Van de Pute and the Road to Leadership. Maybe that's the one. Both of those are from 2008. Incredible pathbreaking work that Sharon has produced and done for us. Our second co-editor, Liliana Patricia Saldana, also a beloved colleague from UTSA and a, uh, actually the co-chair of the Conjunto de Nepantleras of the Esperanza is Liliana Patricia Saldana from Yanawana, occupied territory known as San Antonio, Texas. She is an associate professor of Mexican American studies at UTSA where she also serves as program coordinator for the MAS program, Mexican American Studies. Saldana's research draws from Chicanx, Chicana, Chicano Studies methodologies, Chicana feminist thought, and decolonial studies to examine teacher identity and consciousness, epistemic struggles in education, and colonial slash decolonial schooling practices. 
She has published in nationally recognized journals, including Latinos and Education, Decolonization, Indigeneity, Education and Society, and the Association of Mexican American Educators Journal. She's also co-editor of a couple of books, uh, Latinas and the Politics of Urban Space with Sharon Navarro, and Entre el Sur y el Norte, Decolonizing Education Through Critical Readings in Chicanx Music with Marco Cervantes. That is forthcoming in 2021. Be on the lookout for it. I'm sure we're gonna have an Esperanza book launch. Liliana serves on the Conjunto, as I mentioned earlier, and she's a board member also of the Mexican American Civil Rights Institute here in San Antonio, and is proud of serving her community as a local public scholar. And with that, I'm gonna pass it on to my colleague and friend and neighbor, she lives down the street, Liliana Saldana. Buenas tardes, good afternoon. It's so wonderful to see everyone today. Y pues les quiero dar una, una gran bienvenida y, y gracias por acompañarnos esta tarde para celebrar la publicación de este libro tan importante to celebrate this book, Latinas and the Politics of Urban Space. I don't know if you've had a chance to order your book. I highly recommend it. But this is really an opportunity to introduce our public, our community to the incredible work that activists and scholars and activist scholars are producing and creating to highlight and to show the incredible work that women of color, particularly black and brown women are doing to um, carve political space in, um, in our communities. So I'd like to go ahead and uh, Norm, uh, Dr. Cantu and I would like to take this moment to introduce our esteemed guests. Our first guest uh, is Dr. Sarah DeTurk, is a professor of communication at the University of Texas at San Antonio. She's a dear colleague of mine. Um, her areas of specialization are intercultural communication, intergroup dialogue, social justice activist alliances, critical pedagogy and training group facilitation. She has published in journals such as Communication Jour uh, Quarterly, Communication Education, the Howard Journal of Communications, the Journal of Intercultural Communication Research, and the Journal of Intergroup Relations. She is also author of Activism, Alliance Building, and the Esperanza Peace and Justice Center. Thank you so much, Sara, for being here with us today. Fernando Tornos Aponte is an assistant professor at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County, a visiting scholar at Johns Hopkins University and a Kendall Fellow at the Union of Concerned Scientists Center for Science and Democracy. He earned his MA and PhD in political science from Purdue and a BA from the University of Puerto Rico, Rio Piedras. Dr. Tornos Aponte specializes in social movements identity politics, social policy, and transnational politics. His research focuses on how social movements cope with internal divisions and gain political influence. Dr. Tormos Aponte's work has appeared in the Public Administration Review, Politics, Groups, and Identities, Environmental Policy and Governance, Alternautas, PS, Political Science and Politics, and the edited volumes, The Legacy of Second Wave Feminism in American Politics, Gendered Mobilizations, and Latina and the Politics of Urban Spaces. He is currently working on studies on social movements in Puerto Rico, transnational social movements, and the movement for Black Lives Matter. Uh, excuse me, it was just movement for Black Lives. <laughs> Tormos Aponte has also written for the New York Times, Washington Post, In These Times, Nueva Sociedad, Jacobin, St. Louis, Amer Louis American, and the Entitled Blog. Mucho, mucho gusto, uh, Fernando, y bienvenido. Our next guest is Shariana Ferrer Nunez, who is a young Black queer feminist, Puerto Rican activist, and scholar. She is the co-founder of La Colectiva Feminista en Construcción, a grassroots radical feminist organization in Puerto Rico. Ms. Ferrer Nunez is one of the prominent figures in the feminist movement in Puerto Rico. She was one of the organizers of the Women's Strike, May Day, and other radical movements. 
Ms. Ferrer Nunez has seized opportunities to speak to wide audiences about political practices and insights concerning intersectionality, social justice, and social movements as an invited speaker and organizer at international conferences in Bolivia, Uruguay, Brazil, Chile, Cuba, México, and Ecuador. Muchísimas gracias, Shariana, por acompañarnos esta tarde. And the other speaker that I am uh, pleased to introduce to you is Dr. Teresa Gonzalez, a native of Mexican uh, Chicago, an assistant professor of sociology at the University of Massachusetts Lowell. She received her doctorate and master's degrees from the University of California, Berkeley in sociology and her bachelor's degree from Smith College in Latin American and Latina studies with a focus on literature and history. She firmly believes in the capacity of sociology to redress social injustices and inequalities. As a feminist and a woman of color urbanist, Gonzalez is rooted in community engaged pedagogy and scholarship that's, and strives toward a practice of reciprocity in research. Her work has appeared in the Journal of Urban Affairs and Social Problems, in edited volumes and on academic minutes. Her book, Building a Better Chicago, Race and Community Resistance to Urban Redevelopment with NYU Press will be available in June of 2021. Bienvenida Teresa and congratulations on the new book. And our next speaker is Dr. Norel Martinez. Dr. Martinez is a Chicana Fronteriza from San Diego Tijuana border, uh, from, the, from the San Diego Tijuana border region. She is assistant professor in the Department of English at San Diego City College. She obtained her PhD in cultural studies from UC San Diego's literature department. Her research centers on the witch hunts in the Americas during the colonial era and the recent resurgence, reclaiming and re-empowering of the bruja or witch today by women of color to challenge patriarchy racism and capitalism, or what she calls bruja, bruja feminism. She explores how women draw on indigenous and African-based ancestral knowledge and spiritual traditions to resist oppression. Norel is currently on the editorial board of Punto Rojo, a leftist online magazine that publishes the voices and viewpoints of Latinx thinkers and activists is in current, and is currently working on a book manuscript titled Bruja Fem Feminism. Thank you so much, Dr. Martinez, for uh, being with us today. And our next uh, speaker, and I think the last to be introduced, and I'm so happy because Lourdes and I go way back, we're good friends, is Dr. Lourdes Torres. And she is the Vincent DePaul Professor of Latin American and Latino Studies at DePaul University, for she is also affiliate faculty in critical ethnic studies and women's and gender studies. As editor of the journal Latino Studies and the co-series editor of Global Latina o American Series of the University of Ohio Press, she really encourages and pushes Latinx writers and scholars. Her research and teaching interests include social linguistics, Spanish in the US, and queer Latinidades. She is the author of Puerto Rican Discourse, a social linguistic study of a New York suburb, and co-editor of Third World Women and the Politics of Feminism, and also Tortilleras, Hispanic and the Latina Lesbian Expression. Recent articles are published in Meridians, Lesbian Studies Journal, International Journal of Bilingualism. She served as a board member for Amigas Latinas, a nonprofit organization that advocates for the Chicago-based Latina Lesbian Bisexual Transgender Community. She is currently working on a history of L-L-E-G-O, Diego, I don't remember the acronym for that. <laughs> the National Latina or Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, and Transgender Organization that ran from 1987 to 2004. And she's also researching Spanish language use in Chicago. She's a dear friend and a superb linguist and feminist scholar. Bienvenida, Lourdes. Well, thank you to all for joining us for this virtual platica. Latinas and the Politics of Urban Spaces, which is the first volume of its kind to feature scholarship on Latinas and the ways in which Chicanas, Puerto Rican women, and other mujeres organize politically and lead social movements, either on the ground or digitally. Drawing from a range of disciplines and perspectives, 
you all have offered unique insights on the ways in which women, particularly queer and immigrant women have carved political spaces for environmental justice, for women's rights, LGBTQ community building, intersectional and decolonial activism, and the reclaiming of public spaces amidst oppressive policies that impact our communities. Latinas, Latinx is in particular immigrant and queer women are rarely centered in political discussions and analysis. Historically, women of color have been at the forefront of these spaces and your scholarship captures the ways in which Chicanas, Puerto Rican, Afro-Latinas, queer and immigrant women continue to organize using intersectional, decolonial and feminist approaches. So um, before I continue, we continue, if you have any questions, this is to the audience, if you have any questions or comments, please make sure to jot those in the chat. And Natalie will make sure to get your questions when, um, and uh, we'll make sure to address them during the Q&A. And following on that, I wanna remind you, this is a platica. We really want your questions. Although we have prepared some questions ourselves, we really would like for you to contribute to that platica. So Fernando and Shariana, your chapter titled Intersectional Synthesis, a Case Study of the Colectiva Feminista en Construcción captures the social mo movement organizing created by radical black and queer feminists in Puerto Rico. Fernando, you're a political scientist. Shariana, you're an activist in the movement. Can you tell us about your collaboration, how you went about documenting, analyzing the organization's intersectional approach to organizing and popular resistance? We don't often see these kinds of collaborations. Sariana, go ahead. Okay. Hola. Um, so thank you for that question. I guess that we should ask ourselves why we don't see um, these types of collaborations because um, well, one of the things that we wanted to debunk is like a false dichotomy between um, activism and scholarship, right? In our particular union, right? Fernando and I go way back, I guess around 10 to uh, 12 years ago where we both participated as part of the student movement strike in the University of Puerto Rico. So that's how we kind of met and started building this um, friendship and of course like uh, collaboration between the work that we have been doing in terms of scholarship. And for, for us, it, you know, we have kind of encountered ourselves and connected again um, where when I started doing the internship uh, research program at Purdue where Fernando was finishing his PhD. However, one of the things that well, kind of motivated this collaboration is the work that I have been doing with the members of La Colectiva, right? Um, grassroots political work is very much uh, rooted in Black feminism, right, and, and and Black radical tradition and decolonial theory. So we are not strange, right, to to discussing theory, to reading. We have a political uh, formation school, right, um, La Escuela Feminista Radical, for us, that it's very important and it's a priority to understand um, not just scholarship, but intellectual work, right? The process of understanding our oppression, um, the ways in which is rooted um, in and interlocked systems of oppression, but also how we as not just activists, but political subjects, right? Um, engage in order for us to dismantle um, these oppressions. So for us uh, in La Colectiva, um, we have very taking the, the task of writing our own history, of reflecting and, and engaging political and deep uh, intellectual conversations of our own work and the work of others that 
you know, for us have been inspiration and reference, right? The Kambahi River Collective, um, Black Panthers, uh, you see uh, works on abolition, intersectionality. These are not just concepts for us. This is uh, frameworks in which we understand our own reality and kind of gather tools to change that reality as well. And it has been a very interesting collaboration with Fernando, not just um, as a friend, but also as a colleague um, in the area because there um, has been like a very respectful ways in which I'm not the object of the study. And our collective, you know, is very, um, it's a very strong feminist uh, organization here in Puerto Rico that have led the way and into building social movements, right? So we have, um, there's a lot of folks in academia, right? A, a lot of scholars that want to interview us that have um, done research around the work of our collective, but you know, from a very distant point of view, right? Um, they're just observing what we're doing. They're collecting data around the works, you know, paper clippings, our posts on Facebook, the way they're, you know, kind of with a notepad, right? Uh, gathering and understanding and building up all this uh, work without having our own voices. And how do we understand what the work that we're doing? So this uh, particular uh, experience of co-authoring um, uh, our work, right? The, the work of our collective has been very important. Um, and I guess from a very political and ethical point of view, um, given this opportunity to speak, you know, in primera persona, right? This is not talking about someone else's work, but we are talking and engaging from a political science point of view and, and discipline or transdiscipline, loving that um, collaboration. So, yeah, thank you. Gracias. Fernando, did you want to say anything? I'll just add that our collaboration really stemmed from a mutual understanding of the authorship and the knowledge that uh, compañeras in la colectiva have and that they are agents of their own construction of their own narratives. And that's that was a, a basic mutual understanding upon which we were able to build this collaboration. And, and then we, we engage in conversations that spanned over a long period of time where we began to relate some of the experiences that Shariana would uh, narrate and, and relate it to existing literatures and thinking through, you know, how do these experiences move forward or thinking around building solidarity, the challenges of doing so, the challenges that compañeras en la colectiva faced, even with so-called allies in the Puerto Rican left, um, you know, the kinds of, of masculinities that often served as obstructions for building uh, an agenda for, um, political struggle and popular mobilization in Puerto Rico. So um, it is not something that uh, academia is necessarily structured for because it, it's taken us 10, more than 10 years to build a relationship where we had that kind of mutual trust and, and norms of, of reciprocity. And we didn't come into these relationships with the idea of or goal of publishing something. So you know, for those who come into these uh, relationships with that kind of goal, you know, th they may find that academia may not provide the kind of environment that they need to really develop genuine relationships that continue to, to reinforce that mutual understanding of movements are capable of telling their own story, of generating theory, of engaging in theory, building criticism of existing theory, um, so that's that's been um, one of the, the benefits of our, our relationship, and it's, it's really been a, a privilege for me. No, pues muchísimas gracias. Um, I really appreciate that as someone who works with with community, right? I, 
and, and, and building ethnic studies, right, in, in Texas. And, and I've learned tremendously from, from your collaboration. Um, so the next question is for Teresa. Um, so Fernando and, and Shariana talked about political subjects and dismantling systems of oppression and the importance of building solidarity and consciousness raising. Um, your chapter titled uh, Semillas de Justicia, Chicana Environmentalism in Chicago focuses on Chicana activists who are on the forefront of challenging environmental racism. You draw from a 30 month ethnographic case study of grassroots organizing in La Villita, which is predominantly working class Mexican immigrant um, in Chicago, and you interview with local community organizers and residents. In your research, how did Chicana activists reimagine and redefine their communities, neglected, abandoned, and polluted areas? How did they go about advocating for environmental cleanup of contaminated land? Thank you, Liliana. Um, and also thank you to Chariana and Fernando for, for raising the importance of, of collaborative work, of, of really meaningful work, right? Where, where academic scholarship and, and on the ground activism can really inform each other um, and also be transformative, right? In, in multiple fields. Um, so in thinking about how, how these Latinas, how these Chicanas were reimagining public space, um, I wanna highlight two things. One, I focus primarily on the Little Village Environmental Justice Organization their Chicago-based you know, community environmental justice uh, group that founded in 1991. And they've really historically focused on, on Im the impacts of environment environmental racism across Chicago, in La Vita, and then also in other um, Latina or ex communities. The other thing to keep in mind is that most of the organizers and executive staff are Latinas who live in or near the community. So, Sometimes when you look at these at these nonprofit organizations, the staff, the organizers, you know, it, the organization may be in a community, but the staff and, and executive board don't necessarily live within the community. That's not the case for Alvejo. Um, for the most part, uh, everybody in the organization is committed to the community and lives in the in the community. So when we think about reimagining public space, on the one hand, the organization in and of itself is reimagining public space as it relates to activism, as it relates to women's activism, and then also as it relates to environmental justice, because too often these things are seen as you know, issues that are promoted within white communities. They're promoted by mostly uh, white male activists. So just in and of itself, the organization is, is disrupting um, public space in that way and how we think about activism within these communities. And then at the same time, the group has also really done a lot of work to reimagine their neighborhood, as Liliana mentioned. This is a working class community. This is a working class community that has been uh, Mexican American since the 1950s. Um, it's surrounded by a lot of industrial centers. So you see uh, vast amounts of environmental pollution from a local coal plant, from diesel engines. And then you also see environmental neglects by the city so that you have you know, streets that are not paved, sidewalks that are kind of busted up and the city has ignored. Um, there are several brownfield and there were super fun sites in the community as well. So what uh, this group has really done is try to address environmental racism through um, this kind of two-pronged approach that brings in shared histories and shared Mexican culture that really um, affirms, recognizes, and centralizes these histories of dispossession that Latinos and Equis have experienced within Chicago and within the United States. So when we think about then as they're reimagining these spaces, oftentimes that goes hand in hand with then having to clean up the space before it can be reimagined. Um, and this has happened through three major things and that's grassroots organizing, leadership development, and then really strategic partnerships with other organizations across the city and across the nation. So for, um, in, in the edited volume, I focus on the Semillas de Justicia Community Garden. This was an overgrown, you know, brownfield site that had a, a, a number of kind of ground soil pollution kind of embedded within it. The community lacks a lot of green spaces. There's one park, but it's kind of on the southeast end. Um, if you know anything about Chicago, you know that it, it contends with a lot of gang violence. This community is similar to many others in that way. So anybody who wants to get to a green space, if you live on the Western end, if you live on the, you know, the Northern, Eastern or Western end, 
oftentimes you have to pass through a minimum of five different gang lines to access any of these green spaces. So El Vejo said, okay, how can we start mobilizing residents to start thinking through ways to increase green space within our communities that's meaningful and that's actually connected to the things that we wanna do. So they identified this plot of lands, were able to work with the city, work with an organization. Again, this goes back to collaborating called Neighbor Space to get the, the space identified as a plot that would be used solely for community gardens. They then got the city to help them to do cleanup got the soil capped and then started you know training residents on ways to do community gardening and, and raised beds so throughout um, the space and there's some photos in in the, the edited volume for those of you who are interested in how it looks you'll see a variety of different kinds of raised beds for organic fruits and vegetables they have chickens in the space they have bunny rabbits in the space in the warmer months, they have, you know, when we're not in the times of COVID, right? They have community potluck, you know, dinners and lunches where residents can come together, you know, bring their children and cook for each other using the produce that's grown within this community garden. In addition to this garden, El Vejo again was trying to think out about ways to increase access to green space and started advocating for the creation of a local park that would then be on the eastern end of the neighborhood. And throughout this process, the city identified a plot of land um, that ended up being a super fun site. So it's a long story so, and I wanna keep it short, but in trying to think through, okay, how do we go about ensuring this land gets cleaned, getting the kind of park that we want residents to have access to and that actually represents the kinds of things they wanna do in community. They went door to door, you know, very traditional grassroots organizing knocking on doors and asking, what would you like to see? We want the city to develop a park here. They've already identified this land. And residents started telling them, are you sure you want to park there? Are you sure you actually want to have residents using this space? And when the, when the organizers asked, well, why not? Residents highlighted to them, because every time it rains, we get rashes. Because every time we try to do any kind of gardening in our backyards, you know, we get rashes, we get sick, and we're not sure that this is actually a safe place for people in our community to come to. So through that, through those conversations, El Vejo was able to learn that over 170 homes had been contaminated by this site that the city had identified was the only place that they could have a park in this community. And so what El Vejo did is that they started training residents, this goes back to leadership development, they started training residents on filming illegal dumping on documenting every single time they raise these issues to the city, to the local uh, municipal representatives. They started training residents on how to do soil testing. They also trained residents on how to do um, air pollution testing so that when, when different trucks would drive by, they could see you know, what, what are the rates of diesel pollution in the air. And then they also started working with, you know, trying to get a city to do you know, millions of dollars of remediation on land is not an easy thing. And so what the organization did is they started partnering then with other environmental justice organizations nationally like Sierra Club. They started pressuring the EPA only to learn that the EPA knew about this pollution from the 1990s. They tested soil again in the early 2000s, it still polluted, but you know, the EPA couldn't, couldn't pressure the city, the city didn't want to deal with it. And so what El Vejo did is through the, throughout this time, they just kept documenting, kept working with residents and then finally, after you know the, the first soil that we know of that was um, tested as contaminated was in around 1997, it takes until 2007, 2008 for that land to get capped, for it to get cleaned, and so that anything can be properly then developed on it. So it is really through you know, um, a commitment to real grassroots organization and listening to residents, not dismissing resident concerns, um, but then also bringing in a lot of other organizations that, that can help one achieve many of those goals. Thank you so much, Teresa. It's um, amazing. And uh, the work is ongoing, I assume. It's always ongoing. And uh, I now turn to Lourdes, because your research also captures the work of Latinas in Chicago. And your chapter, The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, Amigas Latinas Platicas as a site of transformative knowledge production uh, focuses on a small support group for lesbian and bisexual Latina women in Chicago. 
that transformed into a nonprofit organization. And you were also part of the organization. Can you talk about Amigas Latinas, what the organization was able to create over its 20 year span? And I think um, I know the answer, but I'm gonna ask it anyway. Why was it important for you as a scholar and a member of this organization to document the work of this much needed space for queer Latina women in Chicago? Sorry. Um, thank you, um, uh, Norma, for the introduction and the question. And, and also thank you to Liliana and to Sharon, even though she's not here for this amazing book and for inviting me to be a part of it. I'm so grateful to be you know, in communion with uh, all the women and men on this um, panel and in the book. So thank you very much. And thank you, Norma, for pinch hitting at the end and coming in when, when Sharon couldn't join us. So um, um, thank you for the question about Amigas. Uh, um, Amigas, as I said, um, started as a small group of maybe 10 women who were meeting together once a month, uh, um, having potluck dinners and um, sharing um, friendships. And um, from that, it evolved over a number of years into a, a nonprofit organization, which had over 300 members and did a number of things. It was an advocacy group for um, uh, queer Latina women. It was a group that uh, educated social workers, educators, um, the media about the realities of Latina women. It created a space for Latina queer women within the mostly white mainstream Chicago LGBTQ movement. It gave visibility to queer Latina women within Latino spaces that before um, Amigas and some other organizations never had conversations where they acknowledged that the queer community was part of the Latina community. And so I think it, it had a very important um, function within Chicago. Um, and um, one of the main ways that the uh, Amigas um, worked with its group was through these platicas. Throughout its 20 year history, it had platicas almost once a month. And it brought together people over a meal and conversation on a number of topics. Uh, the group itself decided what the topics were and they ranged from everything from Latina identity, uh, racism, classism, uh, violence against women, um, sexuality within the Latino community, health, safety, all kinds of issue. And, and in the book, in the, my chapter, I talk about the range of topics. What I think is really important about um, these platicas that Amigas had was the way it made clear what, what Gloria Ansaldúa and Sheree Moraga talk about the creation of theory in the flesh, where uh, women ourselves are creating theory about our lives. And so within the platicas, which were uh, primarily Latinas um, uh, coming together, we developed our own theories about our lives. There was no looking to experts outside of our community to explain our situation. We understood that we were the experts and that we had the knowledge to uh, analyze our lives, to think about um, um, the structural um, barriers that prevented our thriving and to think about possible solutions, that we didn't have to go looking for experts to help us understand that we could develop that theory and um, the solutions within our own group. And I think that's important because the women who were a part of Amigas were um, working class women for uh, primarily, they were, they were also middle-class women, they were immigrant women, they were people who had just came um, as immigrants and some of them undocumented, some of them um, Spanish speaking primarily. We had um, people who were bilingual. We had people who, who spoke English. We, you know, people tend to think about Latinas as a monolithic group, but obviously we're not. And in a space like Chicago that brings together uh, folks from so many different nationalities and walks of life in Amigas Latinas, we were working through all those intersectional um, 
identities and differences. You know, we have the, the platicas dealt with issues uh, about racism within our own community, anti-blackness, right? We dealt with um, language politics and the difficulty of, of speaking as a community when some of us are bilingual, some of us are monolingual in English, some of us are monolingual in Spanish. So Amigas created a space to talk about these issues, to confront the problems within our own community. There was also a rec there was always a recognition that although we were all Latina queer women, there were a lot of differences among us and we had to talk about those differences as well as just celebrating you know, the similarities that brought us together. So for me, that's one of the most important things I want to communicate uh, about the chapter is that I think it's really important for us to see Latinas as knowledge producers and producers of theory. Uh, we don't often think about uh, Latinas who are not in academia as theory makers and knowledge creators. So I really wanted to, um, to um, uh, emphasize that in this chapter. And um, for the, the second part of the, the question, um, and Norma asked why I, 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 um, I wanted to write about this as, uh, you know, as an academic, and it's because I am an academic and I am a, an activist. And I think that um, when I started doing the project in, in, in the mid 2000s, and I, I was reading about um, queer organizing in the United States, we have a lot of histories and stories about queer organizing on the East Coast. We have stories about queer organizing in the West Coast, but the Midwest gets left out. And often what also gets left out are the voices of Latinas and Latinos. So for me, it was really important to document that history to make sure it's part of the historiography of queer organizing and also the historiography of Latinos in the United States. I want to make sure that queer Latinos are represented. And for me, it was a, um, a joyous project because it's an organization that I really love and care about. And so I'm so happy to be able to share this history and um, what it accomplished with readers and with um, scholars and activists. Thank you. Mil gracias, Lourdes. Um, it, it was such a pleasure to learn about the, um, the incredible work that you're doing that you did with Amigas Latinas. And one of the themes that, I, that I've appreciated in the work that everyone contributed was the theme around women as theorists and women as knowledge creators, women as agents of change. The next question is for Norel. Your chapter, Brujas in the Time of Trump, Hexing the Ruling Class, offers an indigenous feminist analysis of what you call Bruja feminism. Can you talk about your concept of bruja feminism and how Latinas and other women of color reclaimed la bruja for political purposes to vocalize their opposition to racism, white supremacy, and sexism imposed by the right? In what ways does digital brujería transcend borders to create spaces for building community, creating new forms of oppositional knowledge and resistance? Hi, everybody. So to here and I'm just fascinated by all the great information on, on uh, organizing and Latina organizing. And um, I'm so on to be part of the project. So, um, we have feminism, it, the, the term which feminism is a sort of coalescing of activism and witchcraft, which wasn't necessarily like a new term, but it was kind of circulating a lot amongst white women who were practicing Wicca. And so, um, and so I, you started to see, notice a lot uh, uh, in the movements in the streets, for instance, in the, during women marches, annual women marches, um, with women with signs that said, uh, we are the granddaughters of witches. Uh, what was it? We are the granddaughters of, of, the, of the women that, of the witches didn't burn, right? And, and I, used, I started to notice more and more signs. Of, wow, right? Uh, I'm just here to do brujería on Trump during uh, signs that said that during the, the protests against Trump, for instance. And so I started to uh, notice specifically, though, that, that self identified Latinas, 
uh, queer Latinx folk uh, were starting to embrace the term and call themselves that word or, or, or name their collectives. You know, for instance, um, Brujas Radio in Oakland. Um, there's a, and, and other, the Hood Witch, which, uh, who has this blog, who's like a tarot card reader. It's, it starts to sort of, that word starts to be used massively, and particularly in social media, right? And so um, I, um, I, I, and then and then it starts to kind of gain speed in like cultural production and a little bit more mainstream. Um, for instance, like uh, Princess Nokia, uh, the Puerto Rican rapper from Nueva York, uh, in the in the song and video Brujas, uh, we see it in um, in for instance, uh, like I mentioned, Las Brujas Radio, Yerba Mala Collective that which I'm gonna speak about in a second. Uh, Brujas Hex Trump, the YouTube video that um, I also wrote about. And then there was this web series called Brujos uh, that uh, was produced by Ricardo Gamboa about Latino, queer Latino Brujos who are um, using their powers to fight against the evil colonizers, which I highly recommend. It's a super great web series. So, yeah. so how I sort of came up with this, uh, well, I didn't necessarily come up with it, but that's how I, I started to conflict with brujas using that word with pride and sort of taking away the that taboo of that word right that is still used as an insult in a lot of ways right to to mm -hmm. demonize women and etc and but because i was seeing how it was used more like from a, like a feminist viewpoint from a more political activist viewpoint it, it doesn't necessarily mean that everybody's it in that way, but that's sort of what I wanted to think through and research and um, and and write about. So it's I I think women were seeing this uh, very much relating the the persecution of witches in, in Las Americas um, with colonization and now capitalism, neoliberalism, etc. With and, and sort of re-empowering that term, reclaiming that term, and saying, yeah, you know what, we are brujas. And get get what do about it, right? And so I sort of, you know, looking more specifically at cultural production, and um, and and so in this chapter, what I look at, I more specifically focus on during the Trump election and um, the Trump presidency, where we start to see like witch in women coming together to put spells on hex Trump, um, and so I write about the uh, YouTube video called Brujas Hex Trump, which was one of the few videos that went viral that was produced by Latina and Black women. And, um, and so it's like a very performative video. And, and, and of course, in this chart, I don't claim that this is, these are like official rituals that occur. These are performative and playful. They have like a super political undertone, right? Um, and so uh, the, the, uh, I also write about the Yerba Mala Collective, um, and these are anonymous anti-fascist witches that um, create electronic zines and they put them on a Google Doc and share them. And it's like spells and poems. And, and, and so they have a series of, of uh, very interesting uh, sort of poems invoking, invoking uh, political figures that who have passed, but also anti-fascist revolutionary figures. So they're very much anti-fascist themselves. Uh, they call out capitalism and they uh, and neoliberalism, et cetera. So that, that was sort of the, my focus there in, uh, in, in this chapter. And so I was fascinated by the fact that this was like a sort of digital um, and performative form of symbolic hexing that was like uh, that was like an equivalent of like what in the African diaspora did on plantations right to resist slavery so um, I talk about for instance the poison of uh, using the knowledge of plants to poison people right and and this is very much documented and a lot of scholars have documented how enslaved women in particular were very good at um, concocting these uh, herbal, herbal concoctions to poison um, the white master, et cetera, right? Um, 
and then um but also like the actual use of rituals and to to rise up to actually um to organize slave uprising so for instance the very famous there's a very famous ritual uh, right before the haitian revolution and slave uprising where cecil fatiman um, according to some sources she was a voodoo priestess who, who led the ritual days before the the uprising right, as a way to like get get everybody ready spiritually for this really important and life transforming event. So, uh, so I make those parallels, even though, of course, it's, n it's very different, right? But, but I, but I make those parallels in the sense of, you know, why, um, you know, what what these women are drawing on, right? Um, and so we still see this today, like for instance, or more recent contemporary uh, examples of that. For instance, uh, this woman named Sula Karuyumbi was a healer in Rwanda, and and uh, and she saved a lot of people's lives during the, the Civil War. She saved over 100 people's lives. This is all documented and journalists have documented this um, by threatening the soldiers, the military, I and mean, she threatened to put spells on them. And, and she had all the Tutsis hidden in her hut and it wouldn't come in because they were scared of her. So um, that's sort of what I, what the, this concept of craft feminism is coming from and specifically more um, this idea from that, that it's a very political, it's politicized. It's it's um, it's not just like just spirituality, right? It's it's not just an individual acts, but more collective um, for the good of all. And so, in regards to Ruka, in regards to uh, this idea of digital brujeria or just the digital realm, um, I, I want to say first and foremost, cultural production is important. It's clearly important. But I, I will say that nothing compares to on the ground grassroots organizing. I think that's always, I will say for sure, is all gonna be, I think, the most important way to create change. And cultural production, of course, is an important part of that. But I, um, but I would say that we can forget about or that place, actual on the ground work, right? So I, I think that it's, transcends borders in the sense that, for instance, Yerba Mala Collective, um, that's women from the US, Puerto Rico, uh, Brazil, the UK. And so they're like collaborating to do this work. For instance, I, I also see like the, the space, the internet space as a space where um, we can see what other women and organizations are doing across the world and get inspired by those things, by these acts, et cetera. And so um, I think that there's a lot of possibility, especially because young people are using the, the, the digital realm more and more. Mm -hmm. So um, thank you much for having me. Appreciate it. And thank you all. Gracias a ti, Norel. And what a great project. Mm. I, I wrote on there, Brujas, Brujas Forever. <laughs> I really think that uh, your perspective adds so much. And uh, I, I haven't read this chapter. I haven't read the book. So I'm really excited about all of them and want to get to them. And last today on our talk, on our platica, is Sara the Turk, who, uh, whose chapter, Place, Space, and the Esperanza Peace and Justice Center, examines mm -hmm. the ways in which Chicana queer-led organizations challenge the use and control of urban space in San Antonio. Remember the title is Latinas in the public, in the politics of urban spaces, and all of these different spaces we've been talking about uh, from Puerto Rico to Chicago and now San Antonio. And of course, I, I love um, Noel that you said that it was the internet. That's the space. It's like there. Mm -hmm. uh, the Esperanza has been around for over thirty years and has been at the forefront of local, national, and international struggles struggles for social justice and human rights. So what led you, Sara, to write about the Esperanza's activism? I know you have a book on the subject. Can you talk about how also the Mujeres of Esperanza apply this Chicana feminist praxis to challenge the use and control of public spaces? Yes, and thank you, Norma. And thank you um, to Liliana and Sharon for allowing me to be part of this wonderful project. Um, so, my 
broader interest is in intersectional alliances within multi-issue social justice activism. Mm -hmm. And when I came, first came to San Antonio, I discovered Esperanza as an amazing example of this work. And, uh, you know, right here in San Antonio. And so, excuse me, so I, I got involved, I volunteered, I participated in different events, and then eventually I decided I wanna do an ethnography of this organization and learn about how they um, negotiate and navigate these alliances with so many different kinds of people and other organizations. And um, I was frankly surprised by a lot of what I found. I hadn't really previously thought about the importance of place and space um, or the politics of urban spaces. And that ended up being a central focus of my book. Um, I was also very intrigued by the importance of the arts and how integrated it is with activism for Esperanza and I think for Latinas in general. Um, and then the immersive role of Chicana feminist praxis um, struck me, it occurred to me that, that there was a, um, a praxis, a, a, a theory that ran very deeply within Esperanza and that wasn't just coming from the academy but also from grassroots theorizing. Um, so those were some of the themes that I wrote about and I focused on three particular um, campaigns. One uh, was called the Free Speech Coalition. And uh, you know, most of these campaigns are still ongoing in one way or another, even though they may have been initiated um, decades ago. And the Free Speech Coalition is um, a project basically to um, push the, the municipal authorities to allow women and women of color to march in the street and to march on behalf of social justice. And um, the second campaign I looked at was the Hay Street Bridge Restoration Group, which was um, a group working to reclaim um, a piece of real estate that had been promised to the community, which is a predominantly African-American space um, as a park, but then uh, corporate interests kind of, um, I think lessened the city's commitment to, to do that. And so Esperanza joined in a coalition to push back and to get the city to you know, live up to their promise. And then the third campaign I looked at uh, was a group called the West Side Preservation Alliance, which is an ongoing organization working to protect the predominantly um, Latino West Side of San Antonio from gentrification and the destruction of historical cultural spaces. And what I discovered in these campaigns and these projects and the work of Esperanza more generally were a number of themes that I characterize as being part of Chicana feminist praxis. And, you know, this is gonna echo a lot of what we've heard throughout the rest of the panel. Um, so one theme is, you know, what Ansaldua called mestiza consciousness, this polyvocal, um, flu fluidly moving among different subjectivities and languages, frequently in subversive ways. So for Esperanza, this means um, street theater, other performative actions um, flowing back and forth, not only between Spanish and English, but also Arabic and other languages. Um, so mestiza consciousness, and then also what I call historicity, which is both um, you know, a celebration of and a focus on the importance of history, but also storytelling, narrative, testimonial. Um, and then thirdly, the importance of multi-issue alliances and coalitions, which, you know, wasn't just my particular interest, but really at the root of Esperanza's reason for being. Um, and again, going back to both the grassroots and the um, academic uh, Chicana feminist theory. Um, and, 
Then finally, a form of leadership that is often behind the scenes and very relational. And I, I kind of learned about this actually through Th Sharon's book. Um, and I saw this, you know, people who were leaders of the East Side community uh, promoting the protection of the Hay Street Bridge, you know, talked to me about how uh, instrumental Esperanza was and its leadership was, was there supporting them in a very behind the scenes way, not wanting to take center stage, but to really offer um, assistance in terms of leadership and communication expertise. Um, so I know we're running out of time and I we wanna bring in all of the audience members who have questions. So I will um, pause there. And if people wanna know more about what I learned about Esperanza, I'm happy to answer or Liliana or Norma can also respond since they're both very up and current on what Esperanza is still doing today. Muchas gracias, Sara. Thank you so much. And uh, I think we do have a question, Natalie. Uh, are you going to ask that? Um, we, we, we did have a question about the chapters of the book, but we went ahead and um, posted the, the names of the chapters in the chat. Okay. So we're good. Right so now. then I do have a couple of other questions um, that I was hoping we would get to. <laughs> uh, why do you think it's important to center political agency of black and brown women in research and scholarship? Um, that's the first one. And I'll just open it up um, to whoever on the panel is willing to jump in. I could start us off, I, I guess, um, just to say that as a, a lot, you know, uh, um, uh, brown and black women are um, uh, often invisible from all of the work on everything, basically, uh, especially in terms of um, people who have an impact, people who lead and are transformative change makers. We just don't see our stories represented in scholarship, in the media anywhere. So it's important that we ourselves, you know, write that history uh, and, and make sure it becomes part of the story. Just to add on to that, um, not only are black and brown women invisible, but they're also purposefully invisibilized mm -hmm. from a lot of the work that they're doing. So if we look at, you know, histories of community ac activism within our communities, it's consistently women, it's consistently black and brown yes. women doing the really hard day-to-day -day work, community organizing, getting folks together, building those relationships, both, you know, behind the scenes and then oftentimes, right, having to take those leadership positions, whether they're comfortable or not, in front of the scenes because they're not actually seeing change happen. Um, and then on top of that, it's also important in terms of transforming that narrative about what it means to be, right, a Black and brown woman in the United States. Mm -hmm. And the fact that we do have agency over our bodies. We do have agency over our politics, right? We do have agency over our ideas. And regardless of how many policies attempt to silence us, right? We're there, we're telling our stories and we're transforming ideas of what, of what that activism can look like, what community can look like and what those relationships um, I think can be and, and are in many places. A kind of follow-up question also that I hope we'd have time for. How do intersectional decolonial and feminist approaches provide us with new insights to how Latinas organize politically to create social change? And I think this question is coming more from, from the book, right, about urban spaces. So how do we, noting the intersectionality and the decolonial and feminist approaches and collaborative like Shariana and Fernandez, and how do we um, how do we create social change? How do we look at all of that to change the world for all of us? I know it's a tall order, but what are your thoughts? Okay, I can go ahead um, and jump right in. I guess that. You know, for us, 
been in Puerto Rico, uh, an, a colony occupied by settler colonialism and also by a, you know, imperialism uh, relationship with the US. And I guess that's the, the reality for most folks living, um, you know, and struggling not just in the global south, uh, but also thinking about the global south um, beyond and how it reproduces lot these types of logics within the US and the territory, right? Um, so for, for us, um, this is not just a, a scholar or an academic approach, is our ways of understanding the, the political work we're, we're doing and engaging. It's for us also, how do we you know, understand decoloniality and the ways in which we also reproduce these logics within our organizations, within the movements. And, you know, I, I um, have to kind of point out um, what Lourdes uh, mentioned earlier and, and uh, you know, bringing the, bringing on Saldua and, and Cherry Moraga, right? And, and at the same time, I think about, you know, Audre Lorde, um, June Jordan's work, uh, mm -hmm. but also local Puerto Rican um, Black feminist as uh, Angela Maria Davila, right? Also poets and, and the ways in which writing their own story from the flesh, right? Writing their own experiences um, centered, right? And, and produce such rich uh, and embodied theory. So our assessment um, from La Colectiva and the many work we have done we have centered our experiences. We are centering, um, you know, it's movement generated theory. Mm -hmm. um, and the only existence of it is to change our reality, right? Change the, the precarity um, of our lives, of our collective lives. And it's no, um, it's not, uh, because, uh, you know, it's, it's not casual, it's not spontaneous that for us, uh, construyamos otra vida, it, it has become kind of like our, our motto, right? Our, our way to understanding that our work aims to build another life, right? A collective life. Our work centers not just to empower ourselves, but to empower and create power and build power from a collective and, and you know popular point of view, right? So we're talking about thinking about um, and embracing the margins, right? The borderlands, um, the cimarronaje, right? The maroonage of not just exiting a system because it's impossible an exit when we have folks, right, that are still going to um, feel that oppression and, and are still struggling with, oppress with oppression. So for us is escaping as not just the fugitive state, but also thinking about the ways in which we reproduce this violence um, within our own communities, within our own organizations and movements. And using these frameworks, you know, intersectionality, um, our chapter talks about the intersectional synthesis of thinking through social and political justice by embracing power and building power from different points of view, not just what we think and how we think power is built on. And, you know, theory as a tool, right? Theory as, as something that we, you know, we are political subjects um, and we are embracing um, our power. You know, that's how at least we are thinking and, and using political subjects, right? We're not objects of, of study. Um, we're not, you know, people that are just living and confronting these, um, 
different sorts of violence, but we're also embracing us as recognizing ourselves, our humanity, mm -hmm. um, something mm -hmm. that, you know, for so many years, we have been disenfranchised um, and we're continue to be invisibilized and erased. So I guess that for us to write and talk and, and speak of our own uh, history and, and stories is confronting and battling that erasure, right? Um, mm -hmm. And I think it was just so, um, I guess it was a, a beautiful um, coincidence, if, if we may say so, that for us to be here and talking about different experiences, right, um, of the communities and, and, and groups and collectives in Chicago and how the relationship has always built. Cause you know, I'm thinking and centering, right? Chicago, for instance, right? Um, and the experiences and the, the terrain, right? The, the, the wetland, if we, we can call it that, right? The wetland that, you know, gave, um, was a breakthrough for the Young Lords Party, which is a Puerto Rican diasporic um, organization that we use as a referente, right? And, you know, situating Chicago as also, you know, what Fred Hampton and the Black Panthers could build the Rainbow Coalition. So we're thinking about ways in which Black radicals, Brown uh, radicals, um, immigrants, feminists, uh, queer, um, black feminists are building and connecting mm -hmm. to create, first of all, to dismantle, right? Mm -hmm. To dismantle what oppresses um, our people, but also to create other forms of, mm -hmm. of community, right? And, and what has been even impossible in our wildest dreams um, as that, uh, for instance, Afir, Afro Futurista, right? Mm -hmm. and, and building that, I think it's very important to tell our own stories, but also the stories that not only draw from experience, but the stories that draw from uncertainty, right? From mm -hmm. giving that uh, space to create and to build something that only lies within our imagination. I think that that is also the task, right? To build what has not been even thought of or can only live in, in our mind um, and universe um, of creating. Muchísimas gracias, Shariana, for sharing your, um, your wonderful insight, your incredible insight. Um, I know that we have some questions in the, um, on Facebook Live. I'm not sure that we have a lot of time to, to address some of those questions because it's 2.13 and we want to make sure that we respect everyone's time. Mm -hmm. Is there like one question? I that... think Natalie was going to ask. Yeah. Um, am I popping? Oh, wait. Hopefully I'm You're popping. there. Okay. <laughs> um, so, yes. Yeah. So, um, a, just a few questions, but um, I, if whoever wants to answer them, um, you know, we can do it quickly or, or if you want to go back later and do more in depth, you, we can um, go back onto the chat and answer some questions. But the first one is, how do you how do you vision the practice of carving out these political spaces in the classroom? Buy the book and uh, make your students <laughs> <laughs> read it. I think, I mean, it, it, it's wonderful that we have this resource now and I hope to see it used in Latino studies classes, in urban studies classes, in classes about organizing, you know, these are wonderful stories people are sharing and they talk about strategies and theories. So I think a good place is to, you know, use the materials we now have. <laughs> Yeah, I, I agree. Um, you know, as a Chicana feminist scholar, as a as a as a feminist pedagogue, as a teacher, um, one of the things that I strive to do in the classroom is to create community, because oftentimes that is not what academia cultivates. 
And so uh, to me, that's really radical, right? To create spaces of conocimiento, a radical conocimiento is to create community in the classroom and, and, and to cultivate that concientización, right? That consciousness raising um, and to do it in community. And to me, that always creates these possibilities, the possibilities that you were talking about, Shariana, um, of, of of seeing that we can change the world, right? And oftentimes my students, you know, as a um, as an educator, sometimes students ask, well, what can I do, you know? And, you know, they wanna change the world, right? They want to create change and they wanna become involved. Um, but to me, community is at the foundation of everything. And I think, you, you know, Teresa, you were talking about that, right? And, and Sara and Lourdes, I mean, com community is really at the foundation of social change, you know, and oftentimes it, it really is the women doing doing the work at the front line. So um, to me, it's always about community and creating that in the classroom. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd like to add something briefly as well, because I'm a community college professor, as you all know, we focus so much more on teaching than on research mm -hmm. at, at community college. But um, a, a, a great strategy is also, and, and I completely agree, Liliana, it's all about community, but also like seeing these, um, using, like as Luda stated, get that, get to read the book, but also how can you uh, get your, like, one, an assignment I do is like, getting students to create their own social movements, even if it's just assignment, right? Um, and so like you actually start to get them to think that they're agents of change, and and them to think that that there's a possibility to make change in this world because oftentimes we're bombarded with these ideas with with all the negative right and and we know like our the politicians aren't doing a whole lot or it's a very very process but like i think this is this book is a great example a, a great model to mm -hmm. um, show students like wait th this is happening and and this these are changes that are being made so like, let's create that in, in the classroom, like I want you to go in and um, research this, but also think about how you would place yourself in, in, this, um, in, these, in, in these movements. Even if you're, they're not actually able to do it, um, I think that's one way, but then also it's their way to like help them connect to their realities in their own lives, to maybe even connect in, in their own communities. Um, with the struggles that are going with other activists and organize, organizing groups as well. Um, and so, uh, I mean, I think integrating that, like making that a, an assignment is, is really fun for, the, for students as well. And, and an opportunity to politicize them. Yeah. Gracias, Nore. I, I can answer a question that I see. How can anyone help or join these groups in San Antonio with limited time on hand? That's a tough one. Uh, we don't have a lot of time. And I think it, how I do it is prioritize and I see the need. And then I think of how I can be, how can my work be most useful? And I think all of the chapters speak to the individual in community, being giving of their best of the ways Lourdes in her work with Las Amigas, definitely Amigas Latinas is bringing her expertise to talk about that, but also being part of it. And I think even Sarah, you said, I volunteered, I got involved. That's the first step, just get involved, be there. Uh, there's many other ways, but that occurs to me for that question. And then the other one, I think for everyone, uh, how do you create theory from frameworks that other white scholars in the academy might not understand or want to understand? And I think that's, an, <laughs> that's a struggle we all face, not just in the academy. It also be some uh, white supremacists definitely don't want to understand what we're doing. Uh, any thoughts on that? Um, I think, you know, just speaking for myself, unapologetically, if we look at all of the, the pieces in, in the edited volume, every single one is highlighting theory come, coming from communities of color, theory informed by right communities of color. And it's done in a way that's not, you know, kowtowing to kind of traditional theory, traditional ways of thinking. Too often, um, 
our communities have been theorized about, have been overstudied from a very Eurocentric lens. And so rather than approaching it as apologetically and, oh, I'm so sorry, you know, I, I need to, to reframe or reimagine or reword what's happening or how, you know, I'm, I'm making sense of, of things that are very visceral to my own communities. It's instead say, I'm going to own it, right? I'm going to put it out there and, and the audience that I want to read this will read it and the audience I want to respect it will respect it. So the piece um, that I have in, in this is, is about Chicana environmentalism, very much about centering right Chicana feminist frameworks in that piece. Another piece I have is called Racha Rasquache activism, very much about centering women of color activism, very much centering very difficult words, right, that not everyone can say, um, and purposely making folks uncomfortable, both with the language that is used, right, not translating words that, that are in Spanish immediately to English, just leaving them as they are not translating. I sometimes also draw from West African um, philosophical concepts, not immediately translating these, but saying, if this is what is making sense to the communities we're working with, and, and how community is theorizing itself, as Shariana has so very eloquently stated, then that stands on its own and should be equally respected as theories coming out of Europe or theories coming out of very Eurocentric spaces. Gracias, Teresa. So um, it, it seems like our time is up now and uh, we apologize if we weren't able to answer all of your questions. Again, we want to thank our panel. Thank you to the Esperanza Peace and Justice Center for hosting this virtual space and the UTSA's Women's Studies Institute for promoting the event as well. Mil gracias, Natalie, for helping organize this event and Graciela Sanchez for inviting us to share our scholarship and the activist work of Mujeres. Y mil gracias to my co-editor, Sharon Navarro, and Dr. Norma Cantu, mil gracias por acompañarnos hoy and facilitating our plática. And of course, uh, follow the Esperanza, be part of the Buena Gente, and let us know if you have any questions about the book. Gracias. Thank you all for, for joining us again. Thank you, authors, editors, Norma. Um, scholars, thank you all so much for being with us and sharing your wisdom and um, your research. And I didn't mention where the book is available. Did, did yes, I'm going to. I'm going to do it right now. <laughs> um, and if I'm and if and if anyone wants to add anything after me, you can. Um, thank you for your questions. Thank you for your comments and for participating online. This book is available for purchase on Amazon and Rutilage if I said that correctly. And um, just thank you again. And yes, uh, I'm gonna, let me highlight you, um, Liliana, so you can show the book. <laughs> yeah. Here it is. That's and I wanna do mention that the cover, um, Mary Agnes Rodriguez is a local artist here from San Antonio and she graciously allowed us to, um, to use the cover, uh, one of her, her, um, her works of art to grace the cover of this book. Um, this is an image that she used, that she painted or she created for uh, one, of, um, one of the International Women's Day marches here in San Antonio a few years ago. So it really captures the spirit of the work that you all did and continue to do. Yes, thank you so much, Mary Agnes Rodriguez. Um, your artwork is beautiful and um, Again, uh, if you want to buy the book, I mentioned Amazon and Rootledge, but the links are on our Facebook page, if that makes it any easier. And um, again, thank you. And if you want to check out any upcoming Esperanza programming, just uh, check out our website or Facebook. Next weekend, we do have our monthly Noche Azul concert on Saturday and Sunday. Saturday is in English, Sunday is in Espanol, and the theme is Boleros. So um, thank you again and uh, take care everyone, stay safe and we'll see you um, at our next event. Thank you all. Thank you.